Today, record reviews and a vinyl update, including my views on the new reissue of Ozzy Osbourne's No More Tears. Plus, I got another Ozzy box set to show you, and it may not be the one you're thinking of that, and tons more. Let's get right into this. Hi, my name is Frank. Welcome back to channel 33 RPM, your channel for vinyl gear and more. First of all, a big shout out to Chris from the YouTube channel, The Vinyl Attack. He sent me this uh, really cool shirt. So thank you very much, Chris. I dig the channel. If anyone has not heard of The Vinyl Attack, well worth checking out the link below this video. All right, a bunch of stuff to show you, but this first one is an album I know many, many, many of you were waiting for for the longest time. I'm talking about the recent or brand new reissue of Ozzy Osbourne's No More Tears. A lot of people hail this one as the best or the quintessential Ozzy Osbourne album. To me, it's good. It's very good, but it is not as good as Ozzy's first two solo albums. Again, for me, No More Tears, however, served a very important purpose. It brought Ozzy back on the Billboard charts. It was the follow-up to No Rest for the Wicked, which did well, but it wasn't exactly his best selling album of all time. But this, this one really went multiple times platinum and again off the backs of singles like No More Tears and Mom, I'm Coming Home. I mean, this did a lot to reestablish Ozzy Osbourne as a solo performer in the 1990s. And I mean, what else can I say about this album? My favorite cut is the title track and that bass line and the tone of the bass there, then Ozzy comes in, not Ozzy, then Zach comes in with his slide guitar. I mean, it's a fantastic song. It's a really unique sounding song. And I would rank that one as one of my favorite Ozzy songs. But enough about that. How about the pressing? Does this one sound any good? And I'm happy to report, perhaps surprisingly, that this is a very good pressing. I mean, my expectations for many of these new releases and new reissues is pretty low because we have seen a lot of quality control issues with scuffing and blah, 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 blah. This one had none of that. The album came out of the jacket in pristine condition and it just sounds really, really good. Like it's crankable. I talked about that bass line in No More Tears. I mean, put the record on and crank and it just sounds stunning. So I have to give these guys credit for that. Uh, the main difference between the original and the reissue is the fact that it's now spread over two albums and it's on 180 uh, gram vinyl. So in, in some ways it might actually sound a little bit better than the original because the original had a lot of material crammed onto one record. But um, anyway, I'm really digging it. Apparently there's a, a shortage of this record right now. I know a lot of people uh, told me via social that they pre-ordered this and they're waiting till November for their copy. So demand is obviously higher, I think, than they expected. Who knows what's going on behind the scenes. So um, for those of you waiting for your copy, it is well worth the wait. I do recommend the 2021 reissue of Ozzy Osbourne's No More Tears. Okay, speaking of Ozzy, here's one I never expected to actually pick up but check this out this um, is the um, box set what are they calling it the blizzard of oz and diary of a madman 30th anniversary collector's edition box set so this one actually came out in 2011 and i remember reading a lot of a lot about it and a lot of buzz was going on about it and the time i never picked it up and truthfully i kind of forgot about it and then for whatever reason, I was on Amazon.ca, the Canadian version of Amazon. I just punched in Aussie vinyl. I think I was curious to see how much um, the No More Tears reissue was going for. And then this record popped up and it was on sale for $119 Canadian, which is a little bit less than $100 US. And I have no idea how these just popped up. I was a 10 year old record, right? I assumed. 
it was long sold out. So uh, I, gr I jumped on the opportunity to get this. I actually got two of them. The first one had, um, a, I might've been too picky about this, but I'm spending that much money, I'm gonna be picky. It had, um, it had a scratch, not a scratch. It was like an imperfection on Blizzard of Oz, which made it pop, 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 like a popping, clicking sound for, you know, probably 20 seconds in one of the songs. So um, I returned it. Let me show you some of these things in here really quickly. It was well worth the money considering all that you get here. And in many ways, there's more value here than some of the belt, than some of the Black Sabbath box sets we've been getting. Anyway, here's the booklet. There is a lot of great artwork in here of Ozzy and Randy. Tons of pictures of Randy. I was a bit disappointed because uh, Ozzy and Sharon have done a lot um, to erase the legacy of Bob Daisley and Lee Kirkslake, who were the original drummer and bassist on these albums. And there's really very few pictures of those two in this booklet. There's actually more pictures of Rudy Sarzo and Tommy Aldridge, who... Um, who didn't play on the album, but they played on the tours for these albums, um, or most of the tours for these albums. So that was kind of disappointing. Anyway, we got a full-size, double-sided poster, which is uh, pretty neat. It's too hard to open it, but one side is the Blizzard-inspired uh, poster, the other side is the Diary of a Madman. Here is the... Um, Here's the Blizzard of Oz album. And some people have asked whether this is the version where they erased um, Bob Daisley's and Lee Kirkslake's drum and bass. Um, this is not, this is the original album restored and remastered. So black, it's vinyls in there, it sounds good, it's flat. And there's two CDs. One CD is the, um, the album, and the other CD is um, Ozzy Live. This is recorded on the Blizzard of Oz tour with Randy Rhodes, and it is a great show. That concert was later released on Record Store Day several years ago as Ozzy Live. I don't think you can buy that CD anywhere else. Here you got Diary of a Madman. Again, these are my two favorite Ozzy albums. And you have the CD here. We got the vinyl here, the record there, black vinyl. And then you have the Diary of a Madman uh, compact disc, and then you have the DVD. And the DVD is really cool. It's, um, it's a documentary on uh, that whole era of, uh, of uh, Ozzy's band. And I made a note here. It's, it's got a lot of uh, Randy footage. Um, some of it I had seen before. For example, the after hours footage um, from Rochester, New York, where they play the four tracks. But there's also some stuff on here I had never seen before. So this package is, for me, was worth getting even just for that DVD, because that stuff you can't see anywhere else. And then it had this, whatever, kind of cheesy. You got Ozzy's cross, you can take that out. <laughs> I'm not much for the trinkets, I'm more about, uh, more about the music. Anyway, uh, if you can find a copy of this still, it's worth checking out. It is a cool addition to my Ozzy Osbourne collection. All right, next up, or actually not next up, I know a lot of people have asked me if I've picked up the new Iron Maiden release and um, and whether I would be reviewing it. And here's the scoop. I have not picked it up. I have not bought it. I have streamed it a few times. I think I've listened to the album in its entirety twice, and it's very long. Um, so it took me a while to, to do that. I mean, here's the thing. I am not a big fan of modern Iron Maiden and the whole prog-ish direction they've been slowly taking, well, slowly, I've been going down that road almost for the past, you know, decade or more. Um, even back in the day, I was more of a Two Minutes to Midnight fan than a Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner fan, right? Maybe I have a short a short attention span. I don't know, but the, the longer proggy stuff, I'm not a fan of. So for that reason, I have not bought it and I'm not going to review it. Um, again, it's not fair. It's not really um, my cup of tea, so I'm not going to go there. It's funny, I mentioned that again on one of the socials and someone said, well, if you don't like the uh, if you don't like the new Iron Maiden, you are not a true metal fan. I was like, what? 
I'm just happy to see that Maiden is still putting out new content. And I did see them last time they came through town, which was a few years ago. Sold out show. Those guys are still awesome in concert. They bring it every night. And they're probably more popular than ever. So good for those guys. But I have not picked up the new album. And I probably won't. A few weeks ago, I opened the mail and this CD came in from David in Scotland. This is Idlewild 100 Broken Windows. I told you I'd listen to it and come back with my thoughts and opinions on it. So here you go. This compact disc was released in 2000 and these guys are quite popular, quite big in Scotland and Britain and in that part of the world. They are quite revered from what I have read online about these guys. And unfortunately, they are pretty, they are pretty much unknown in this part of the world. And it's funny how that happens, right? Like bands um, that can be huge over here are unheard of over there, right? I mean, I can think of one example in Canada being this Tragically Hip, which is which I'm not a big fan of the Tragically Hip, but they're considered like Canada's premier rock band and they're not well known in other parts of the world um, at all. Anyway, uh, Idlewild, they started off as kind of like a snotty-nosed punk band and kind of chilled out and mellowed out over time. Um, this is their, I believe, their second release and that, um, and in many ways, is considered their quintessential release from what I understand. It is um, toned down. I mean, there's still maybe some elements of that punk and that anger, but it's much more, um, I would say it's similar to early... R-E-M. I mentioned the Tragically Hip. I mean, if you like the Tragically Hip, I think you like these guys as well. And it's a really good slice of um, early 2000s indie rock. So if any of that uh, sounds interesting, I'd recommend checking out Idle Wild. David, thanks, man. Much appreciated. Cheers. Speaking of Canadian content, I picked this up. This is Big Sugar's second album called 500 Pounds. This was a recent record store day release. I believe it came out on the August drop. I just bought it in September, so I'm not exactly sure. Big Sugar are not very well known outside of Canada. Um, they started off uh, much more of a traditional blues, blue alternative blues um, band, and then over the years, progressed to kind of like rock, hard rock, hard blues. And then as the years went on, they incorporated reggae. And now, I mean, he, it, there's almost a pop element to them in some ways with their latest release. But I'm um, quite the interesting band if you're not uh, familiar with them. This came with an individually signed insert and just a really good album. I said this is sort of their transition from being a traditional blues, uh, hard blues act to being more of a hard rock rock act. So um, their next album that came out after this, Hemivision, was their big breakthrough. But uh, I'm digging this. I picked this up at the Winnipeg Record and Tape Company. So thank you, Kevin, for uh, suggesting I check out this pressing. It is very good. And if you're uh, interested in this kind of music, check out Big Sugar. Another Canadian act I want to show you. This is Sloan with their 1996 album, One Chord to Another, and overall their third release. If you're not familiar with Sloan, they were sort of, or they are, they're still around. They are this alternative rock band from Canada's East Coast, heavily influenced by the Beatles, but they occasionally get like this ACDC vibe going as well, which is pretty cool. But um, a lot of earworms. These guys are have a real knack for producing indie rock with a real pop sensibility in these big choruses that just get stuck in your head. This is not my favorite Sloan album. My favorite Sloan album is um, Navy Blues, which was quite huge here and had some great tracks, but this one's pretty good. There's some filler on here, but my favorite tracks are um, The Good in Everyone, Everything You've Done Wrong, and I mean, there's some other good tracks on here as well. I mean, for me, it's not as good, as I said, as Navy Blues, but I dig this album cover. If you can see that, the colors, the imagery, all good. So um, if you're interested in checking out some Canadian 90s and 2000s um, indie rock that still stands up and sounds good today, I recommend checking out Sloan. All right, 33ers, thank you for making it this far. Let me know what you thought of today's episode in the comments below. Do you have any of these albums? I'd love to get your take on them as well. Otherwise, I hope you have a great rest of the week. Until next time, keep on spinning. Thank you.